If you want to keep growing, don't forget to invest in training. All right, welcome to the Field Famous Podcast brought to you by Field Routes, a show that shines the light on the field service industry and the dedicated professionals that grind every day on their journey to success. I am your host, Christopher Fasano. Before we begin, I just want to remind you that the best way to receive new episodes for this show is to subscribe to your favorite pod player, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your shows. You can get it there. It pushes right to your phone much easier that way. The show is also available in video format on YouTube, so if you prefer to watch it that way you can go to youtube and subscribe and last but not least please leave us a five-star review if you're really loving the show that'll help others find it and also learn from the stories that we're going to hear so on today's show we have shell hartzer shell is a consulting entomologist from 360 pest consulting shell are you ready to be field famous i guess so yes this is, you this are. is terrifying you're here <laughs> so you're going to be field famous i'm um, looking at shell, right. for anybody that's watching on youtube you can see that she has these two pictures uh are this it's roaches or is it beetle what do we got well okay so so one of them's an oriental cockroach the other is a field cricket really they look remarkably similar yeah they're they're close so you can see for people on youtube this is the this is if you want to see good benefit of watching it onto youtube you can see it so shell um uh, why does Shell have pictures of roaches and things on her wall? Tell, let's a good lead in for you to introduce you, you know, yourself to the audience on who you are and what you do. So let's start there and then we'll get into the conversation. Yeah, so I'm Shell Hartzer. I am a board certified entomologist. Uh, both my degrees are in entomology. And what I do now is I help small and mid sized pest control companies who don't have their own full time technical and training director. You're still growing. So instead of being one of the big guys with a full time person, you need something smaller. You need something to intro to that. So that's what I do. I come in with that smaller package, giving you all those resources that the big guys have, just on that smaller scale that you need it right now. So when you say training, what do you mean by training? Training in their technical abilities on how to identify how to treat or is it so what do you mean by by the by the training component of this? Sure, pretty much anything service related. Okay. So I'm not going to train you how to do your route management Correct. or anything because that's that's or way not, outside, or not but. like sales. This is purely on the technical <laughs> side. Yeah. Exactly, you know, and the nice thing about it is, you know, you as that smaller mid-sized company decide what you want to train on. You don't have to be like, oh, the only thing that that's this week is cockroaches. You can say we really want a training on ants and we get to customize it to exactly what you want and exactly what your folks need. OK, that's cool. So the the uh, the maybe this is the obvious question for me is how did you go down? Where did this road? So I would say, like, you know, in life, you got these journeys and you got all these roads and like you find a road, you go for it, you go down it. You went down this road. So what what brought you there? I'm curious. Did you was there always a fascination in this or where did tell me where this began? You know, this is all a series of happy accidents. Um, yes, I, I don't so think it's a road. I think <laughs> I just dove off a cliff a couple times. <laughs> Um, so I did not start out as an entomology major, but that's where I ended up um, and decided to go to graduate school. So I have a master's degree as well. And then kind of floated around just a little bit and came back and did research. And I was uh, working in a lab that looked at stored product insects and, you know, can they penetrate certain packages? And I was out in flour mills doing research on what's in flour mills. And from there, got you know, brought over to the industry side, basically. We were doing such practical, real world experiments. I had a lot of that experience, even though it wasn't quite in industry yet. So went over, started working with IFC, which is the industrial fumigating company. It's one of the Rollins brands. Okay. And from there, went over to Rollins and now I'm now, here. Now you're there. So tell me about the, I'm curious in, for example, like in graduate school in this field, is there, is it a catch-all? In other words, are you learning about all aspects or is there like sub subspecialties? Do some entomologists deal with certain things? How does that, how does that work? Because there's a lot of pests, there's a lot of things. So how does mm -hmm. that, how does that work? Oh, there's a lot of insects. There's a lot of, it's a <laughs> ton of insects, right? Different kinds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is very specialized depending on who your advisor is and what they're looking at. So we have some really great urban entomology programs across the country. Um, I actually studied something called a soybean stem borer, which is a little beetle that affects soybean plants. Okay. <laughs> so 
So my master's actually had nothing to do with this. But from that, um, again, series of happy accidents that moved me from one place to the other and really got involved in food facilities and then the rest of pest management. So, but for now, right now, you you don't just uh, working with commercial, uh, with a commercial angle, this is any any shop or any pest control, anything that wants to have better training and understand what they're doing better. Is that right? Any any pest control company that, that wants growth still and that they're looking to improve their service. Because we know that if you improve your service, you have fewer callbacks, you have happier customers, you have better reviews, which gets you even more right. customers. Okay. So, you know, just looking at that service aspect. So so there isn't a one there isn't a one solution for all things here in this game, right? And so this is clearly oh, what no. you're you, like you and like anything else, it requires an expertise to understand, diagnose, if you will really get to the heart of it and fix the problem, right? So if that's part of what's in the training. What are you looking for? You know, how to find and then how to how to handle. Is that right? Is, is, is that where it begins? It's this approach of here? Abs- okay. Yeah, I'm just Absolutely, curious of yeah. what that approach then- looks like. And then we go a little bit farther. Um, you know, having me basically on staff, I'm there to help you troubleshoot the stuff that just doesn't fall under the 90% of what we do that works perfectly. It's those weird problems. So, you know, companies that I work with get to call me up and say, this is what I've been dealing with. We've already done A, B, and C. What do we do next? Okay. And I, I'm curious, does this is this a do do, do most do most companies in the industry, let's talk like, I guess, you know, just for the sake of, we'll talk like residential, because this is what I'm thinking is the most ubiquitous around. Do they have, do they have a lot of input on this or are they just going at it themselves? In other words, in your experience, do you see a lot investing in this? Uh, I imagine what you try to do is say you really do need this, but do you see a lot trying to adopt this or do you feel it's still an area of opportunity for a lot of companies out there? I definitely think it's an area of opportunity. Um, You're either a big guy and you have a full-time person or persons on your staff, or you're one of the smaller ones and you have Google and Facebook. Right. So, you know, I, I want to give that that excellent resource and, you know, just letting people know that it's out there and that it's a valuable thing that can help their company continue to grow. That's, you know, that's a message that's beginning to get out there. And I'm, you know, like we said, there's a lot of bugs, a lot of pests, a lot of insects, a lot of things. They've been around forever. They've been pests for as long as humanity has been in existence. I mean, people can just read stories about plagues and locusts and, you know, th- things like pests are pests and they've been around, but they yeah. change. The, and, you know, things change. And with different climates and with different things going on in the environment, the pests, I imagine proportion of pests or whatever, they all change. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about some trends, maybe some things that you have seen um, that were once and maybe that are no longer or things that have changed and things that are more pervasive, things that are more out there, just, just to talk a little bit about that because you have this perspective that I don't think a lot would have. Yeah. So, I mean, we can go back decades to when grandma used to sift her flour. And the reason she had to sift her flour is because there were usually some beetles in there. Um, We have much better packaging, much better processing now. And even over the last few years, we've seen a shift. COVID really really messed with things Mm -hmm. in a way because we all shifted and we all moved and that meant the pests had to move too. So we saw a a huge amount of rodent activity, basically. Um, Rodent activity shot up over COVID. And from what I've been seeing and hearing, that's that's pretty consistent um, from last year too. You know, it's always hard to predict what's going to be the thing uh, with climate change. Climate change is messing with everything, too. We're seeing a lot of pests that we thought were only southern pests that are now getting up there towards the north. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's 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 a tough thing, but I w- I would definitely say we're seeing we're seeing much more acceptance of baits and smaller treatments. We're seeing much more acceptance of IPM methods instead of just let's just spray the baseboards and get out of here. Okay, can you explain IPM to me? What what is that? Yeah. Integrated pest management. Integrated pest um, management. There yes. you go. Okay. Yeah, just using all, right. all the tools you have available, you know, the sanitation aspect, trying to find the root cause of whatever is going on and not just put a Band-Aid on it. So what what is I'm, – I'm, I'm in New York and, um, and seeing all the crazy, like, rat 
uh, the rat situation in New York City, they had to have a rat czar, you know, and someone that's going to come in and, you know, I don't know if you can ever fix the rat problem in New York City. What is it about the rodents through COVID? What, what was it? Do they... Was it like I know in New York City with being outside and things like that, just the way the food and the restaurant like but what 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 is it that's led to such a rise? So all living things need food, water and shelter. And when you take away that food, when all those restaurants closed down and you took away that food and those dumpsters were no longer filled up with all that yummy stuff that they eat they had to go somewhere else. They had to get that food and shelter from some other place. And so what that did is that moved them, that moved them towards more of those, I'll say residential areas, but where the people were. We saw the same thing in New Orleans. Um, New Orleans, the French Quarter shut down. And again, the rats, the mice, they moved outwards more towards the residential where this was now going on. The other thing is, and, and you're in New York, so I mean, New Yorkers are up 24 seven, but you know, when people started to work from home, oh, they all heard of a sudden them. they were home during daylight. And now they're seeing stuff that happens during the day instead of just being home oh, at night. Oh, man. So more people recognizing it, more people calling in, more rodent issues. Okay. All right. Um, curious to get your take on, um, you know, from, from again, coming from, I think the in the food industry and commercial, like there is this mandate, like you clearly have regulations and you have to do this in the home. You know, you want to have a clean and sanitary home and you don't want pests in your home, but it's not mandated. No one's coming out and making sure that you didn't do, you know, you don't, you didn't have your treatment or you no one's doing that. It's on yourself, which presents the challenge to pest control companies and how they're going to get, you know, how, how can they make sure that the pest, that the residential homeowner, the homeowner saying, I need to call this company. And not only am I going to call them, but I trust that they're going to A, take care of the problem. Um, and, you know, B, um, it might be a preventative thing, you know, and C, it's not going to harm me. And I know, I know a lot of people think that nowadays. Um, this is a, it's a, it's a science. This is a scientific approach to how things are are handled. Do you feel that um, the perception of pest control industry is that that they're the, do you think people feel that you know they're just coming out to my house and they're spraying it down? I could do the same thing if I go to Lowe's and buy something and like. Do you feel that there's um, they've done a good job in the industry of of demonstrating that scientific knowledge that you might help them provide to let them know that no we're going to do this different. Does that if that does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think it's up to the consumer. Like you said, I can go to Home Depot and buy something off the shelf and treat my house. But is that really going to do the job? And I'm perfectly okay with DIY. Go ahead, DIY it, you know? And then when it doesn't work, you're calling up your local pest control company. Right. So there's always going to be those people who want to DIY it, and hopefully they're doing it correctly and they're reading the label. But when the problem gets to the point that they don't want to, or again, those customers that are like, I don't have time to DIY, I want, I'm gonna hire somebody to do right. it. And then they're looking for that good pest control company. Right, and what about what about the safety aspect? Do you see this as a change in the industry? I mean, there's this movement towards more green, possibly more organic uh, solutions where it's not just to come in and we're just gonna hose everything down and kill everything. Um, do you, is this something, do you get, is that a possible line where people will ask you, like, like, is there ways we can do this that might be a little more, I'm using the word green or environmental or eco-friendly. Talk to me about how that's evolved a bit. Oh, definitely. Um, a lot of pest control companies now offer a green service. So, you know, there's definitely the consumer draw for that. I mean, we wouldn't have that service if customers weren't asking for it. So there's that. And plus, you know, most of our labels for our pesticides don't allow us to hose down something. So we're working with baits, which are nice small placements out of the way that people can't come in contact with them. You know, we're doing crack and crevice treatments that are just right to get into those cracks where the pests are actually hiding. So as an industry, we've gotten to that point that we're putting the right product in the right place in just the right amounts. And that I think is actually more green sometimes than mm, some of the right. green products that yeah, are that out makes there. Sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And you you said the right amounts. And uh, I'm a scientific background and I remember in microbiology and understanding that, you know, for anyone that's fo followed COVID and learning about mutations, how things evolve, when you're using high levels of antibiotic or, res or, or some sort of spray or some sort of treatment, things find ways 
to evolve and change so that they don't die or they don't, you know, aren't as affected by said sprays and pesticides, right? This is the will of life. And if you if you do put enough what we call environmental evolutionary pressure on something, most things will eventually die, but you'll get the ones that persist and evolve to survive it. And then when they reproduce out, you have this sort of new wave of super bugs. I'm curious to hear about that. I would imagine that would be something that you would definitely be brought in on. Like, I can't get rid of these things. They seem to be resistant. Is there resistance in pests? Do they build it up? And t talk to me a little bit about how that's evolved over time. Oh, they, there's absolutely resistance, um, especially with German cockroaches, with bed bugs. Um, there's some new research out with rodents that rodents are becoming um, resistant to certain rodenticides. Jeez. And it's exactly like what you said. You know, if we're putting down the same thing, if we're using that same antibiotic over and over and over again, yes, the system says, I'm going to find a way around this. Right. And that's why, you know, we're very careful. A, a good pest management company is very careful about rotating their products. And in rotating the products, they're rotating that active ingredient, that that antibiotic to, to compare right. it to what you've got. And that then, you know, switches it up enough that they can't quite get there. Okay. And one of the big problems is the DIY stuff. Most of the DIY that you buy off the shelf is all the same active ingredient. Right. So unfortunately, our customers are causing some of that resistance. Right. So they're getting rid of those. But then what's left are the ones that they can't get rid of. And then the problem gets worse because right, because then I'm going to exactly. keep going and buying the same thing and spraying or doing, doing, doing. And I'm like, these aren't going away. And then you get the, then they call the pest control company and they got to come in. So is that so that is a is it a standard? Forgive my ignorance on this. Is that a standard practice in the industry to be rotating chemicals and doing that um, or was something you would I'm imagining that's something you would advise and when you when you come in do you see that as that common practice I think most companies have gotten very good about rotating their cockroach baits. Okay. Um, some of the other stuff, not so much. Uh, I talk a lot about rodents. I, I love talking about rodents. And I've asked so many companies, I'm like, when was the last time you changed your rodenticide? And they look at me like I'm crazy. And they're like, we've never changed it. And I'm like, you're still using the same stuff after 10 years? <laughs> So, yeah, it's I, I think there's still some room to grow okay. on that, right. but we're getting there. OK, cockroaches. What what's with those little things? Why? You know, you make people, they, you know, the durable people that are durable get compared to cockroaches, right? They'll never die. They're always there. I lived in a, I lived in a, I lived in an apartment in Manhattan that um Roaches are just part of the deal when you live in Manhattan. And it, you, I remember you, you know, the super, I'd be like, I, there's roaches in my apartment. He's like, go downstairs. There's a, there's a, there's a book, put your name on the list. And I went down there and there was literally like 15 names. And, and I'm like, where am I? <laughs> and so then sure enough, I, I talked to a couple of buddies and they're like, no, no, it's not you. You, you can live in the nicest place in Manhattan. There's going to be roaches. So I'm just, what is it about them and why the German ones? I hear the German ones are super stubborn and hard. What What is it about them? It's a lot of different things. Um, they're small, so they're sneaky and they get into the tiniest cracks. There's there's some really cool videos about watching a cockroach flatten itself to get through a, a crack and crevice. Also, they like to hide. They're mostly nocturnal, so people right. don't see them during the day. And the females will carry their egg case with them, which means that female that's in that you know wall void that you can't get the pesticide to, she's protecting her egg case. Yeah. And that's 40 eggs that are coming out every single time. So it's a combination of things, but they're they're very resilient. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, I always and I I remember because when I would work with um, um, companies from down south. Um, you would, they would always, th there was always a point of when to ask, like, what are the, what do the roaches look like to get the explanation? Cause the, the German ones are the smaller ones, right? The bigger ones are, are not the, the German ones. And, and I remember I lived in Miami and we had palmetto bugs is what we used to call them, or they are, I don't know if that's the proper name. Is that the proper name for them? The palmetto bugs? It's, it's a very pretty name for a cockroach. Okay, you know, but, we can't but it's still a cockroach, right? It's still, it's still, it a, is still yeah, a cockroach. Cause they look like a cockroach, it <laughs> behaved, but they were big suckers. Those were big, mm -hmm. big suckers. So those, oh, and they fly. Yeah. And they fly. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're nasty. They were gnarly. I, I remember that. So there is resistance. And this brings back to this point of training where, you know, if you're going to want to grow and you want to provide the best service for your, for your customer, you have to be aware that things like this are going on and you want to make sure that the product will rotate 
to avoid that. Uh, I talked. We talked about this a little bit, Michelle, before before we started. Was bed bugs. So I was reading this. Um, it was by Ibis. I was just reading the report, you know, for for pest control in the industry and where 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 where, where it's going and the things like that. And I was reading two things. One, I was reading about this expansion of hotels and motels that's happening or growing and to maybe to accommodate the new travel and the resurgence of people on the road and going back back you know after covid that bounce back in the regard to bed bugs and the bed bug industry and then i was also reading about this the resistance sort of in bed bugs and bed bugs showing up in places where maybe they weren't traditionally thought to to go so First of all, question is, what is a bed bug? I, I'm curious, like relative to other bugs and why do they like a bed? And then secondly, talk to me about the bed bed bug situation and, and then I wanna get into some of those, the treatments of that. So let's start with what a bed bug is. All right, so a bed bug is a small true bug. You know, we, we have beetles, we have flies, we have these orders right. of insects. So it is a true it's bug. It's a true bug, and okay. It is a true bug. Okay. Um, wingless, they don't jump, they don't fly. It's about the, the size of an, we always say it's about the size of an apple seed. And it's about that color, that kind of mid to light yep. brown color. Yeah. And they live in beds because they feed off of, um, like this is like skin dead, matter it's just matter right is that what it is biological oh, no. matter these, these are vampires these these and are after your and that's blood right. they bite um, you that's right you get all the bumps <laughs> it's the classic this is why i have bed bugs so they will suck your blood right they're mosquito yeah, and, yeah and so they could care less about the bed actually um it's just that we spend a lot of time in the bed okay um and so that's where they're going to be because that's where you are most often okay but if you have a situation like you spend most of your time on the couch or okay. on a chair, they will absolutely okay. be there. So they are, they, the bed part of the bug is not necessarily depict the true bug. The bed bug is just where its meal most likely will be. So that's why it's there, yep. which could explain the expansion to showing up in places like I read movie theaters, for example, and things like this. People were sitting, you know, for periods of time. So they get in there and they, they can live and they can hide their small. So what about the treatments of them that can prove to be difficult? Because what I've read is that it can be difficult to get rid of them completely. I've also read that there are dogs that can that can smell bed bugs, which is incredible. Like that, that just, yep. So what is it about them? And what are some things that 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 might be offered in training or something like that that you might do to, to help in that regard? Yeah, well, one of the things is that the treatment has to contact them. Since they're since we are their food source, we can't put a bait down or, you know, expect them to be attracted to, to something else. So we have to have treatments that contact them, that they're going to crawl through. And getting to all the hiding spaces that mm. they're in can be really challenging, which is why we occasionally do fumigations. We will occasionally gas a place or do heat treatments because that can that can penetrate a little bit further farther and a little bit better sometimes. And it kind of depends on the level of infestation. If you have a house that is severely infested, yeah, we're probably going to do a heat treatment or a fumigation. Okay. If you have more of an introduction, we can do some smaller treatments and target it better. Okay. And I am I I this for for the homeowner, this would be a more of an expensive treatment, I would imagine, than the average. Uh, you know, there's mice in my house, and I have to get you know, so, right? I, I could imagine that could, it could be costly. So on the on the on the residential side, it's a problem that no one wants to have, and they want to get rid of, which presents an opportunity yep. for demand for the company. And for the company side, it could be a, it, I guess it could be a lucrative service in, in addition to the ones they normally provide. But do all, can all pest control companies and operators do this or is it, do they elect to do it? Or is it a specific type of training and service that you could find with one? Because I, I don't see all pest control companies offering it. And I'm wondering, is it just a technical limitation or it's just a strategic decision? Um, a lot of pest control, I would say most pest control companies do offer it. Um, the the latest state of the bed bug market just came out and, you know, had, I, I can't remember what the percentage is, but it's a very high percentage. Some just don't want to get into it. Um, some of the, if you want to go into heating or fumigation, that equipment and the training that you need for mm -hmm. that is, is extensive yeah. and expensive. Okay. Um, doing traditional treatments um, can be a lot easier. Um, and so in some cases, people just don't want to do it. Okay. Other cases, they say it's a great opportunity. Yeah. I mean, it, it, se it, it seems like that. And I guess with, with it on the rise, um, you know, 
clearly they'll be around and it's not it's not something that's going away or getting any better i guess is what well from what i read so it seemed like a good opportunity i just wasn't sure that sounds like one of the answers that there is an extensive piece of training and or equipment that you need to add in addition so i guess that's a decision do you want to invest and do you want to do that at that point um you know for somebody that's been in this for a while that really understands what's going on um you've seen a lot you know you continue to see things um what do you what do you see as I don't know, some advancements in the industry going forward that you think that like, if I'm, if I'm listening to this, I have a shop, like you said, I'm not one of the big guys, but I'm, you know, I'm growing and I want to grow. How can I, what can I do to position myself to, to be better than the other? And, um, you know, line that up with what you're seeing as trends in the industry that are coming down the road. Yeah, obviously just doing a better service. Um, you know, it, it, we're, we're all about the, the online reporting systems and getting five stars. So the, the better you do a service, the more you get with that. Um, from a technology standpoint, one of the cool things um, that I've been following for a little while is the remote rodent monitoring, sometimes called electronic yes. rodent monitoring. Okay. And what that does is, you know, when the trap gets set off or when the rodent goes in, it sends a signal to me on my cell phone and I can say, oh, you know, Mr. Jones's house over there, I got to go check it. But these 20 other houses have no signals, no no set, so I can just ignore those, which can save a lot of time for rodent control. And they're working on this for insects. It's, it's slowly coming along. Obviously, insects are smaller and we deal with a lot more species. But for rodent control, that, that can be very lucrative um, if, if you set it up correctly. It's interesting for insects. What would they do there? They would have, the, they'd be able to detect a feel almost like tactile when they're moving or something like that or it, a, a, it's a picture it's yep. a picture um the, they'll just stick the it'll catch the movement and then a picture will be taken okay all right wow see technology yeah. that's pretty wild and it's all about being more efficient right it's that's the really like the thing we hear all the time in the industries is is how do we be more efficient you want to go to the place to the house to the wherever you're going the most min minimal amount of times required to get the job done because every other time you go it's gas it's expense it's taking tech it's a re reroute so any way you can get more efficient i would imagine helps out um when you do these trainings or when you come in, if, so if I'm in the shop and I call and I say, Shell, I need you to come help, how, what does it look like? How, how, is it like a, is it prescriptive time? Is it like, well, it's going to be uh, three months? Is it, I obviously it'll depend, but is it as needed? Tell me a little bit about how it works because someone who's listening to this might say, wow, that sounds really interesting. What, what does that look like? Yeah, I do a whole bunch of as needed trainings. So a lot of companies hire me because, you know, this week they want to do an outside perimeter training. And I say, okay, how long do you want it to be? What, you know, what aspects do you want me to cover? And I will design a training that's customized to exactly what they want. A lot of my customers are my recurring customers. And so we have them on a monthly basis. And every month they get a package of goods. And usually that that package of what I'm providing to them includes a monthly training. And again, they get to decide what that is. They get to decide what it looks like. And I design that specifically for them. So it's it's very catered. It's very specific okay. to meet their needs and make sure they get everything they want. And is this done online? Do you, do you, do you go out there, the portions of it online and portions of it, you know, they're doing on their own? What does the structure of it look like? Most of what I do can be done virtually. Okay. Um, obviously, with trainings, you know, we've got some good training platforms. Yep. And, you know, cell phones are great. I've been on a cell phone with a tech in the field, and he's walking me around a structure, and I can see what he's seeing. And I'm like, wait, go back a little bit. And we can troubleshoot that way. That's cool. If they do want me out on site, that's absolutely a possibility. And I go out and do that a bit as well. Okay. All right, cool. Um, I, I want to know from an entomologist, do you have a favorite bug? Do you have an all-time oh. favorite bug or uh, a favorite, what we call a pest, or it's too hard to narrow it down? I guess maybe what's, what's the, how do you define favorite, but a bug that you really like that fascinates you? So I'm... I I love spiders. Spiders are just the coolest. And there's this one spider, um, small family, that's called an ant mimicking spider. So it looks like an ant. 
And so it lives near ant colonies and feeds off of them, but uh, the ants just see it as another that's ant. Super so smart. It's, it's such a cool little spider. That's cool. See that evolution? That's super smart. Look like what you mm-hmm. look like what you want to eat for dinner, kind of thing, and then you go yeah. you go grab it. That's really cool. Now, what about what about a crazy like a crazy story out on a job or when you were working with a company or something like something where they called you or someone was like. I got this problem. Like, I obviously don't have to say who it is, but I'm curious if you're like, whoa, and it's something that was just super different or super interesting. Yeah, that that's the only time I get called out. You know, I don't get called out. When <laughs> they don't call are you nice when they're like, pretty. there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of ants here. Show, come see it. It's it's beautiful. <laughs> so no, no, when I the get phone rings, there's when, something going down. Something's yeah, going down. Oh yeah, there, there's something. Um, you know, the one that comes to mind immediately is uh, we had a, a food warehouse and we were finding cigarette beetles in it. Um, and cigarette beetles are a stored product pest, so they can penetrate some packaging. And of course, we don't want bugs anywhere around right. our food. So the thing was, is we were finding them in really weird places. We were kind of finding them in the middle of that warehouse. And, you know, they'd done tons of monitoring. They'd done some treatments, gone through everything they should go through. And so looking at it, you know, I'm sitting there going, what is going on? And I looked up and there's a vent right above this space. And so we went up on the roof and we checked that vent and there was a filter that hadn't been installed correctly. So it was sucking the the cigarette beetles in from the outside and putting them right in the middle of that warehouse. Oh man. So it's like opportunistic. They weren't even like, it was just pulling them in and sucking them Mm -hmm. in and then they would get in. What yeah, is it about so, those beetles, by the way, that that can allow them to penetrate the packaging? Is it just the way they're mandible or they're, how they can get in? Is that that it? It's just certain bugs can exactly. do that and certain yep. bugs can't? Yeah, and some of them will find the smallest little hole and they'll lay their eggs right around that tiny little pinprick hole. And then the larvae, you know, squishes itself basically into that little hole. And that's how some of them get in as well. Oh, so they almost like positioning the offspring to like have the access to the food because they, oh, wow, super smart. See that? You don't really yeah. think to them to be smart, but they do. They they have nervous systems, correct? Like what is their makeup? Sure. And they have like, um, I mean, is it a brain? That, is, it, is it the equivalent or no? They have, they have, a, they have. My point is like, they don't think like we do. They're not cognitive, I would imagine. They're not weighing choice. They're just going. But they have coordinated, clear mission, right? They know that they have to thrive, survive. They have to eat, reproduce. And that's their mechanism. So any way they can get that advantage, I guess they like like laying your eggs near a pinhole to get in so they can get food. Seems to be a very smart thing to do, right? Well, it's, you know, it's kind of the opposite of resistance. You know, they have evolved to the point where the ones that can lay their eggs right around those pinpricks are the ones that survive. So they're the ones that go on. And, you know, just like resistance, they're always finding ways to to keep to going keep with going. that. Yeah. Well, so if I am I'm just looking at the time, um, I'm trying to think of the, how we can wrap up this question. If I am a um, in the industry and I'm really, I'm ready to grow. I got a good place. I got a good, you know, I got a good market. I got customers and I want to make this year. Cause when we're recording this right now, it's the end of January. So I want to make this my year and I really want to, I'm willing to invest and I want to do something. What, what would you tell me to do? I mean, below maybe bias, but you would, you would probably push to say training, give me some things that you would advise them to do to really help them stand out and sort of take it, their business to the next level. Yeah, absolutely with training. I mean, training does so much. It's not just giving them the information. It's refreshing it. It's making those technicians feel better about themselves, that they can go out and solve these problems faster and better. It's investing in your technicians, which of course makes them feel better. So training is a huge part of that. The other thing I'd say, the the big advantage of having a technical person is handing off all the questions of, What's the best product to use? Can we use this? Have you looked through this label? Um, you know, you see that all the time. What's the best product for ants? Um, but with a technical person taking what that situation is, I can tell you what the best product to use is. I can tell you exactly what you should do. And again, that helps to solve that problem faster. So those are those are two of the right. big benefits. Right. Plus, you get to say you have a board certified entomologist on your staff. Well, so that's that I was going to ask that. So people that do that, they're able to claim that, they're able to say that or at least, you know, trained by or working with or have one on what because I I I distinctly recall um this was way back in the day um 
looking for, I had a, some, maybe it was a carpenter bee. I had something going on. I needed somebody. And I remember looking it up and I remember seeing that. And I, as a, as a scientist myself, I stood out to me and I was like, wow, mm -hmm. they must know what they're, they must know what they're doing. Not to say that the others don't, but that's the way my brain, I saw that. And I was like, wow, I'm going to call them. And I called them. So I, I was going to ask you, like, is that part of it? Like I can now, I don't have one on staff, but we're working with one, right? Exactly. And so for my recurring customers, um, my month to month customers, they absolutely claim that they have a board certified entomologist on staff. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. You know, I, I have taken those tests. I have to get something like 140 credits every year to maintain that certification. Okay. So it's ongoing. So it's not just like right. take a test and you're done. I have to keep this up right. doing a number of different things to to make sure that I'm still current on everything. Well, which makes sense because like we were just talking about things change and nothing ever stays the yeah. same, especially with these 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 bugs and these pests. Well, Seashell, the time went fast, right? It went super quick. Um, and thank you for being the first entomologist that I've had a this long of a conversation with so i appreciate that thank you so much and um again just want to thank you for joining the show today i want to remind everybody out there that for more info on this show you can go to bfieldfamous.com tell your friends subscribe on apple Podcasts, and remember that your success is fame worthy so come tell your story shell hartzer thank you so much for joining us today thanks for having me this was great